Good afternoon everyone. We are the group 3. We will be discussing chapter 4, Teaching Approaches and Teachers' Pedagogy. So the first lesson is Types of Pedagogical Methods. <clears throat> Before we go into the list of teaching methods, let us first learn about pedagogy. Pedagogy is defined simply as the method and practice of teaching. So let's now go to the list of teaching methods. First one, we have teacher-centered. Teachers are in charge of the classroom and direct all activities. The students are just listeners that faces the teacher. Uh, group work may take place, however, most of the time the teachers are the one explaining concepts and assigning individual work. Second one is student-centered or constructivist approach. In this approach, children may sit in small groups and possibly move around the classroom freely. Children play a more active role in their learning and may even help choose the topics they learn about. The student-centered approach can be difficult for teachers to master or perfect. However, the results and the outcomes can be very positive when the approach is effectively employed. <clears throat> Next is project-based learning. It is a teaching method that falls within the student-centered approach. So as the name suggests, in this approach, students complete projects. These projects that students are going to do are meaty projects in which students acquire knowledge, research, think critically, evaluate, and more. Also, an important tenet of the project is that the students have a choice. Fourth one is Montessori. This type of teaching is based on a methodology that's over 100 years old, yet it continues to offer a novel approach to creating a student-centered classroom. Maria Montessori was an Italian doctor who worked with poor children in the early 1900s. She developed her methods based on careful observations of the children in her care. The Montessori method is most popular in preschools, <coughs> kindergartens, and lower elementary grades. In this method, the teacher prepares an ideal classroom environment full of activities that children may pick from to work on. The teacher guides the children to ensure that they choose an adequate number of lessons from all of the subject areas. Also, the Montessori method includes areas of the curriculum that teach social skills and practical life skills such as cooking and cleaning. Inquiry-based learning. Teacher guides students to develop critical thinking skills and problem-solving skills. To learn these skills, the teacher helps students to think through their process, teaches them possible approaches, and encourages them to try various methods. Students are also encouraged to fail as part of the process and then improve their performance in subsequent activities. This approach is a student-centered approach as it requires active participation on the part of the students. The next is flipped classroom. In this fascinating approach to learning, homework is very intentional rather than being extra practice. Homework is a preparation for the next class. With this approach, students may watch a video or lecture about the content and ideas that will be used in the next class. In other words, lower orders of thinking in Bloom's taxonomy such as remembering and understanding are relegated to homework. Then, Classroom works focuses on higher orders of thinking and learning, such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating. The word flipped represents the four pillars included in this type of learning. The flexible environment, learning culture shift, intentional content, and professional educator. As you can see, the second pillar refers to culture shift from the traditional approach where students are more passive and students are more active participant. As a result, this approach is also a student-centered teaching method. Cooperative learning. Cooperative learning involves a lot of group works. However, it also requires a lot of structures and interventions from the part of the teacher to make learning as effective as possible. Some commonly used cooperative learning strategies include think, pair, share. Discussions in small groups or pairs can also be effective as can a jigsaw approach. Essentially, cooperative learning believes that social interactions can improve learning. In addition, the approach recreates real-world 
work situation in which collaboration and cooperation are required. Last one is personalized education. Personalized education takes the student-centered approach to a new level as much as possible, responding to each individual's learner's unique needs, strengths, and weaknesses. Through individualized instruction, learning is tailored to the students. A very effective form of learning, personalized education can achieve outstanding learning outcomes. Some examples of this approach included the Montessori method, which strives to allow each student to follow their own interest and move at their own pace. Finally, a personalized education approach may also mix in cooperative learning for a balanced mix of social and individual learning. So good day everyone. So for the next lesson, we'll talk about the time-tested method. So I've seen search in the internet of there are two types of method, which are the inductive method and the deductive method. So let's tackle first the inductive method. So inductive method is also called as the um, indirect instructions. So the inquiry of a method or the problem solving method and the project method falls under the instructions. So while the guided and the experimental approach falls under the instruction, so they begin with some um, questions, um, problems, and um, details. So they end up also with some answers, um, generalizations, and um, conclusions. So inductive method, it's also called as the discovery method. So through the inductive method, um, one may arrive at the fact, um, principle, truth, or a generalization. So the inductive method has its um, advantage, the disadvantages, and the aims. So the first one I'll talk about is the advantage. So for the advantage of inductive is first one is um the learners are more engaged with um the teaching learning process. So with our um facilitating skills, the learners formulate some general generalizations or rules. So, and the second advantage of the inductive method is that learning becomes more interesting at the outset because we begin of what they know or how, or how they will know the subject matter. So, the third advantage is that it, um, it helps develop our learners' high-order thinking skills with the HOTS to see patterns and um, analyze the same in order to arrive at the generalizations requires analytic thinking. So let's move on to our disadvantage of the inductive method. The first one is um, it requires more time and so less subject matter will be covered. And so for the second disadvantage of inductive method is that um, it demands an expert facilitating, facilitating skills on the part of the teachers because um, we've got to ask the right questions, organize the answers, and lead the learners to generalizations or conclusions. And so for the aims of the inductive method is that um, it is to help pupils to discover important rules about themselves and also some cater continuation of the time-tested method, another type of this is deductive method. Deductive method is the process of reasoning from the general to the particular. Deductive method are also called as direct instruction. It is the reverse of the inductive method. In the inductive way, specific cases are studied and a generalization of rule is arrived, while in the deductive way, the lesson starts with a generalization and it is tested or applied in specific cases. The active method aims to teach learners to master difficulties by utilizing truth or rules to be established by other learners. It also aims to teach students to delay judgment until truth is proven and not to judge even in the face of seemingly certainly until analysis. There are two types of deduction. 
First is anticipatory and second is explanatory. First, anticipatory. Anticipatory refers to the forecast details that will be found in a particular situation. Next is explanatory. It connects facts at the hand with principles that interprets them. Here are advantages and disadvantages of the deductive method. First is its advantages. We do not need to worry on what questions to ask to the learners that will lead them to generalization or conclusion, and it's also simpler than inductive method. There are disadvantages of deductive method. It is not supportive of the principle that learning is an active process. There is less involvement on the part of the learners. The learners do not take part in the generation of conclusion and generalization. Learners' involvement will be on the drill or exercises that come after the explanation. Good day, everyone. I am Dakai Francis Shnaya. I will be going to report about Lesson 3, Teachers' Pedagogy, Approaches, Methods, Strategies, and Techniques. An approach gives rise to methods. The way of teaching something which use classroom activities or techniques to help learners learn. Teaching approach is like the form or the way we teach or how we do it. There are various approaches which are used in teaching learning process. The following are the main approaches of teaching learning. First is teacher-centered approach. Teacher-centered approaches are more traditional in nature focusing on the teacher as instructor. There are sometimes referred to as direct instruction, deductive teaching, or expository teaching, and are typified by the lecture type presentation. In these methods of teaching, the teacher controls what is to be taught and how students are presented with the information that they are to learn. Second, child center approach. Student-centered approaches, sometimes referred to as discovery learning, inductive learning, or inquiry learning, place a much stronger emphasis on learners' role in the learning process. When you are using student-centered approaches to teaching, you still set the learning agenda but you have much less direct control over what and how students learn. Third, inductive and deductive approach. In inductive approach, students move towards specified to general. At first, many examples are put forward to student and then he draws out a conclusion on the basis of these examples. Then, deductive approach is opposite to inductive approach because in it, first a principle or rule is put in front of students and then it is clarified by giving examples. Fourth, perversion approach. This approach is given by John Frederick Herbert. He advocated that teaching should be planned actively if we intend to make it. This approach is based on appreciative mass theory of learning. Therefore, he gives more emphasis of teacher presentation. The proposition of that theory is that the learner is like a clean slate and all the knowledge is given from outside. If new knowledge is imparted by linking with all knowledge of the student. It may be acquired easily and retained for a longer period. The teaching content should be presented into units and units should arrange in a logical sequence. The emphasis is given on content presentation. According to Herbart, advocated five formal steps in teaching. First is preparation. Second is presentation. Third is comparison and association. Fourth is generalization, and fifth is application. First is preparation, a process of relating new material to be learned to relevant past ideas or memories in order to give the pupil a vital interest in the topic under consideration. Example, the testing of the previous knowledge. Second, utilization, the previous knowledge for introducing the lesson. Second, is presentation. Here are aims of the lesson should be stated clearly and the heading should be written on the blackboard. 
We have to provide situation for both the teacher and the students to participate in the process of teaching and learning. Our ultimate aim of presentation is to make concepts understandable to the students. Third is comparison or association. More importance should be given in this stage to compare the facts observed by students with another concept by way of giving examples. By making use of this comparison, the students can drive definitions or theories. The students are encountered to give these suitable examples for the concept instead of the examples given in a book to make them think in an innovative manner. Fourth is gener generalization. A procedure is especially important to the instruction of adolescents and designed to develop the mind beyond the level of perception in the concrete. As far as possible, the task of formulation should be left to students. The teacher at this stage should try to remain in the blackboard for providing only necessary guidance and correction. Fifth is application. Using acquired knowledge, not in purely utilitarian way, but so that every learned idea becomes a part of the functional mind and aid to clear vital interpretation of life. This step is presumed possible only if the student immediately applies the new idea, making it his own. Next is evaluation approach or Bloom's approach. The concept of evaluation approach is given by B.S. Bloom or Benjamin Samuel Bloom. His main emphasis was that testing should be based on teaching and both activities should be objective-centered. Today, teaching is organized by using the evaluation approach. Would refer to the procedure within an approach. So we use method depends on a scientific done an approach and has a step-by-step -step procedure to solve a problem. So when we teach, we use method to know what kind of activity we should use in order to teach students effectively. So it is a process or procedure whose successful completions result in learning as a means through which teaching becomes effective. So the third method covers both strategy and techniques of teaching. So def different strategies may be adopted in the following a method. So method refers to the formal structure of the sequence of acts commonly denoted by instructions. So there are two main types of teaching method, which are non-participatory method and participatory method. First is the non-participatory method. So non-participatory method, in this type of method, teacher casts himself or herself in the rule of being, a, of being a master of the subject matter. So the teacher is looked upon by the learners as an expert or an authority. So learners, on the other hand, are presumed to be passive and copious recipients of knowledge from the teacher. So examples of non-participatory methods are lecture method, and demonstration method. Second is the participatory method. So participatory method, so this refers to the way in which teachers and students are in constant interaction, active involvement, and continuous exchange of views and ideas in the overall teaching and learning. So this method is sometimes known as interactive teaching method or learner-centered teaching method. So it is a shift from the from a belief that learners are empty, are empty plate who are supposed to be imparted with knowledge, the belief that learners can construct knowledge and and learn on their own if they are properly guided. So they are designed only for smaller groups of participants, but their advantage is that they encourage better pretension of learn. So examples of participatory methods such are discussion method, question and answer method, and project method, and problem solving method. So now let's go to the strategy. So what is strategy? Strate strategy is that skillful planning of a working system by which the objectives can be achieved easily. So strategy changes according to the ch changing situation. Teaching strategy means that you have to achieve learning objectives. So according to East Stones and East Morris, teaching strategy is generalized plan for a lesson which includes structure, decide learner behavior in terms of goals of instruction and outline of plan tactics 
necessary to implement that strategy. So if we use strategy in teaching learning, in teaching learning situation, then it, then it is known as instructional strategy. So it means the determination of some policy before presenting the content with the help of with the help of which teaching objectives are achieved. So for example, the blackboard. So blackboard is a strategy to to provide visual structure during lecture or discussion. Second, the free writing. So free writing is a strategy for encouraging students to explore ideas in writing. Lastly, the debate. Debate is a te teaching strategy in which students organize plan presentations for various, various viewpoints. Outcome-based teaching and learning or OBTL. Outcome-based education is an educational theory that bases each part of an education system around goals or outcomes. By the end of the educational experience, each student should have achieved the goal. Okay, so outcome-based teaching and learning or OBTL is a student-centered education approach where the program's intended learning outcomes are explicitly defined for students to achieve. Teaching and learning activities are then carefully designed to facilitate students to achieve these outcomes. The success of OBTL is based on evidences from the assessment results and student learning experience. Periodic reviews of these evidences will lead to continuous improvement of program quality. Outcome-based education is a model of education that rejects the traditional focus on what the school provides to students in favor of making students demonstrate that they know and are able to do whatever the required outcomes are. The emphasis of an OBE education system is on measured outcomes rather than inputs, such as how many our students spend in class or what textbooks are provided. Outcomes may include a range of skills and knowledge. Generally, outcomes are expected to be concretely measurable. For example, students can run 50 meters in less than one minute. Okay, so instead of students enjoys physical education class. A complete system of outcomes for a subject area normally includes Everything from mere recitation of fact, for example, um, students will name three tragedies written by Shakespeare. Uh, to complex analysis and interpretation, so students will um, analyze the social context of a Shakespearean tragedy in an essay. Writing appropriate and measurable outcomes can be very difficult, and the choice of specific outcomes is often a source of local controversies. Each educational agency is responsible for setting its own outcomes. Under the OBE model, education agencies may specify any outcomes, such as skills or knowledge, but not inputs such as field trips, arrangements of school, school days, and teaching styles. The outcome-based teaching and learning approach focuses on the articulation of HSUHK's liberal plus professional educational model and the desired graduate attributes. It also focuses on the alignment of the desired graduate attributes, program intended learning outcomes, and module intended learning outcomes. So a learning outcome should be a clear and specific statement that will identify what student must demonstrate to successfully pass their course levels. Then it also focuses on the development of teaching and learning activities in enhancing student learning experiences. So enhancing student learning includes the engagement of the students in an active learning, hands-on activities, and experiential learning events. Then the design of assessment processes to monitor student learning progress and the achievement of the desired outcomes and attributes. So assessment allows both the instructor and the students to monitor progress towards achieving the learning objectives. 
Then the outcome-based teaching and learning approach also focuses on the collection of stakeholders' feedback for continuous improvement. So feedback can help formulate better decisions to improve and increase performance in order to have a continuous learning.